Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Professor Andreas Velendowski, Head of School of Mathematics and Physics, uh, which hosts uh, Lincoln Math and Physics uh, Week 2021. Uh, welcome uh, to our final day, final afternoon of uh, lectures. As, ev as every day during this uh, uh, week, uh, we had uh, uh, two lectures. Uh, we'll start with mathematics lecture uh, this afternoon. Uh, before lecture starts, uh, I uh, give a, a few minutes introduction to hosting school and university. And if you came to previous lectures, uh, you would already heard this introduction. However, if it's your first uh, time you came, this introduction is uh, for you. And now a few words uh, about hosting school and university. Hello everyone, I'm Professor Andreas Velendowski, Head of School of Mathematics and Physics at the University of Lincoln, which hosts uh, Lincoln Mass and Physics Week 2021. Uh, this week uh, forms a part of uh, uh, British Science Week, which runs also the same date. Uh, this year we have uh, our um, events, uh, lectures, all online. Uh, traditionally, in previous years, uh, you would come to our public lectures, to our lovely campus uh, uh, by the uh, Brayford Pool, by Waterfront. This is how campus looks um, in the evening. Uh, but today we uh, we do it online, uh, and in my introduction, I just would like to give you a few words about uh, uh, our uh, uh, university and the school which organizes these uh, uh, lectures. Lincoln is a, a small city for approximately uh, 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, our university is... Uh, uh, right next to the center, just about 10 minutes uh, walk. The city itself is quite old. It was already found by Romans uh, soon after they came to the British Isles. Uh, once it was also a uh, base of famous Legion 9 Hispania before legionists moved to, uh, uh, to York. Uh, the city received quite early uh, in '86 uh, prestigious status of a colonia, uh, so it became Lindum Colonia, and Lincoln name came later on, and uh, that already happened in times of Emperor Domitian. Uh, the place uh, <clears throat> had a forum and a bath and uh, all uh, facilities uh, of Roman times, and was a uh, a place for uh, retired uh, uh, legionaries. Uh, even today, you still can find uh, remains, Roman remains, and you can walk or drive under this uh, uh, Roman arch of uh, Roman gates. The only one in Britain through which uh, traffic is still allowed. Next big step in Lincoln development uh, was in times of another visitors. The William the Conqueror, William the I, uh, uh, came to British Isles. Uh, very soon he ordered to build a, a famous uh, Lincoln Castle on the top of Lincoln Hill. And uh, uh, some years later, uh, also, even more famous Lincoln Cathedral uh, started to be built uh, just opposite to Lincoln Castle. Uh, this cathedral is considered to be uh, one of the uh, most beautiful buildings, if not the most beautiful cathedral uh, in Britain and probably uh, around the world. Uh, for some period of time, that was in fact the tallest building on the planet uh, when a uh, wooden spire was uh, uh, on the top of a main tower. Uh, cathedral uh, is, of course, uh, was a seat of uh, learning already from Middle Ages. However, university appeared in Lincoln uh, much later, in the end of the uh, 20th century, uh, campus uh, by the waterfront was opened uh, by Her Majesty the Queen. 
And uh, uh, much later, already in 21st century, uh, College of Science uh, was open, which included School of Mathematics and Physics, uh, which opened its doors in uh, 2014. And three years later, we also opened our own building, which uh, we share with schools of engineering and school of computer science. And just uh, in about months, uh, we will be celebrating four years of this beautiful Isaac Newton building named after Isaac Newton, a gentleman who also uh, comes from Lincolnshire. And uh, our lectures are primarily aimed at those who study mathematics or physics at A levels, because they're accessible to everyone who is curious about maths and physics. Uh, but maybe those who study a maths and physics level will think about continuing the education after the school. And therefore, I'll mention what our school has here on offer uh, regarding degrees in maths and physics. As you see, we have full range of degrees, uh, bachelor, three years degree, and integrated masters, both in mathematics and in physics. Uh, we have also various combinations, uh, for instance, combination of uh, <clears throat> another Asian subject, uh, one of the most ancient subjects, philosophy. So we have a degree in mathematics with philosophy and physics with philosophy, where philosophy is a minor component and physics or math are a major component. And we have also a combination of mathematics and computer science and mixture of mathematics and physics as well. And with that, I welcome you to our uh, uh, next event in Lincoln Mars and Physics Week 2021. And I hope you will enjoy it. Welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. We move in now to main part of our program, uh, which will be lecture. And I'm very uh, pleased uh, uh, to be joined this afternoon uh, by uh, Dr. Anita Telesundaram, uh, who is lecturer in the School of uh, Mathematics and Physics here in Lincoln. Hello, Anita. Hi, everyone. Hi. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I'll just uh, very briefly introduce our speaker and then we will move uh, uh, to the lecture itself. But I uh, mentioned that uh, at any time during lecture or after lecture, uh, you can uh, post your questions uh, uh, directly in the live chat of YouTube stream, so somewhere there. Or uh, if you would like to ask a completely um, anonymous question, you can place it in a Padlet link and that link is also, you can see already in a live chat of YouTube, or it was also in your uh, uh, electronic uh, ticket. Uh, so uh, again, I'm very pleased uh, uh, that our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Anita Telesundaram, uh, who obtained her undergraduate degree and research degree, uh, a doctorate degree, PhD, from the University of Cambridge. Uh, her uh, PhD was awarded in 2012. After that, Anita worked on uh, research positions uh, uh, all around the globe. Uh, first, uh, was in the Harish Chandra Research Institute, Allahabad in India, uh, which followed uh, with uh, two uh, research posts, uh, first in the University of Magdeburg in Germany, and later in the University of Dusseldorf where she was also holder of personal Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship. Uh, in 2016, Anita joined uh, our school here in Lincoln, and she is also a member of Research Center for Algebra, Charlotte Scott Center for Algebra here in Lincoln. Uh, welcome, Anita, and floor to you. 
Thank you very much, Andre, and good afternoon, everyone. So let me um, upload my presentation. So today I want to speak to you all about Hausdorff dimension. And so let me tell you about Hausdorff dimension. But first, let me tell you about um, my research in general. So as Andre said, I am part of the algebra group in Lincoln. And um, my research is in uh, what's called group theory, which is one field in algebra. And so what is group theory? So group theory, loosely put, uh, loosely put is um, the study of symmetries. And so which is my presentation should be loading now. And, okay. Right, I hope you can see it. Um, brilliant, okay. So um, yes, as I was saying, let me tell you a little bit about my research. So um, I work in a field called group theory. And what is group theory? So this um, is the study of symmetry. So group theory is the study of symmetries in pure mathematics. And a group is just a collection of symmetries. And um, the study of symmetries, so the origin of group theory dates back quite a while back to the time of the ancient Greeks. And um, they initially, so the form of group theory that the ancient Greeks studied back then um, were they studied symmetries of regular shapes, such as the symmetries of a tetrahedron or the symmet symmetries of a cube, such as the rotation of a cube. Um, so that's where group theory began. So the, the study of symmetries of physical objects. But then, um, as mathematics advanced, so we're talking around the 18th, 19th century, mathematicians started studying um, symmetries abstractly, in the sense that you forget about the object that you're acting on and just you study the symmetries as abstract objects. So this process of abstraction is a very powerful tool in mathematics. So let me give you a simple example um, that shows you that abstraction is a very powerful tool. So for instance, the quantity two, so we're all used to the quantity two, um, this is the abstract quantity two, and that's not a big deal for us nowadays. We're happy with thinking about an abstract quantity too. It's, it's no problem for us. But this wasn't always the case for mankind. If you go back way in the past, um, people were always used to thinking of the quantity two in um, association with an object. So two objects, uh, two apples, say, two people, two oranges. And it took mankind um, this leap to abstract out this quantity two and just say two and not to have to worry about two what. So that took it a while for mankind to adjust to this process of abstraction, talking about an abstract quantity two, but this is something we're used to, so it's no big deal for us. But just to let you know, just to to reflect back that it, um, it took, it when it first came about, first thinking of two as an abstract quantity, it took a leap of um, mankind to sort of change the way of thinking. But Okay, so why is this, this is a good example of why abstraction is a very important tool in mathematics. So when you abstract out um, uh, um, an in intrinsic mathematical quantity, so say the number two, um, you can do so much more with it. So you can, when you have this concept of an abstract quantity two, you can divide by two, you can multiply by two, you can take to the exponent two, and if you know about logarithms, you can take logarithms to the base two, Whereas if you're always thinking of two as in terms of two apples or two people or two oranges, what does it even mean to divide by two apples? So when you're always linking, when you do link a quantity to um, the situation, you're weighed down by the situation. So that's just a quick example of how this process of abstraction is a very powerful thing. It just allows you to go further in mathematics. So back to groups. So initially, um, mathematicians studied groups in association to uh, symmetries of objects. And then, but how I and most other mathematicians who work in group theory nowadays uh, study groups is we study as abstract quantities and you forget about the object that you're acting on. Okay, so that's just a rough introduction to group theory. So there are many things one can study um, about groups or to do with group theory. And one of the aspects that I'm going to talk about today is what we call Hausdorff dimension. So this is part of my research in group theory, um, Hausdorff dimension in groups. So 
what is house of dimension? So we are familiar with the word dimension. Um, so one dimensional objects, that's not a problem for us, two dimensional things. We live in a three dimensional world. So what house of dimension is, is um, a generalization of our intuitive concept of integer dimension to non-integer dimension. Um, so house of dimension with the concept of house of dimension, we have a meaning for something that's of dimension um, 1.76, for example, something of dimension 0 0.54. So house of dimension is, is a generalization of our usual concept of integer dimension. Okay, so that's kind of roughly what house of dimension is. And it was introduced by um, a German mathematician called Felix Hausdorff in the 1930s. And initially, so as I said, I study house of dimension in the context of group theory. But initially, when house of dimension was introduced, it was in the context of fractals and shapes in nature. So what are fractals? So these are kind of um, irregular objects that when you zoom in, they still look just as irregular, so they don't smooth out um, no matter how much you zoom in. So some examples in nature are like snowflakes, they're kind of spiky, and if you zoom in on one of the spikes, it's just as spiky, it's this is crystal structure that kind of repeats. Um, so snowflakes are examples of fractals. And this kind of broccoli, this is also an example of a fractal. So if you look at one of your broccoli heads from afar and then zoom into one of the little tiny heads, it looks just like the original big broccoli head. So this is um, this fractal property that you have that you can zoom in and it looks exactly like the original picture. Um, so you've got lots of examples of fractals in nature. So snowflakes and broccoli are some of the examples you see here, but also coastlines, lightning, um, galaxies and arteries are also examples of fractals. So one of them, um, so initially in the, in the 1930s and also thereafter, house of dimension was used to sort of, um, sort of classify fractals in the sense like how fractal are they um, by by working by assigning a house of dimension to each fractal um, so for instance if your fractal has house of dimension which is strictly between zero and one um, so that's kind of saying that your object doesn't take up as much space as a line would um, and also if your house of dimension say for example is strictly between one and two we'll see an example of this um, in in a minute that um, that's saying if your fractal has dimensions strictly less than two, it's got no area, but if it has house of dimensions strictly greater than one, it somehow has infinite length because it takes up more space than a line. Um, so house of dimension kind of helps you understand properties of your fractals. And um, one sort of claim to fame for house of dimension was the so-called coastline paradox. So a paradox is just um, uh, a phenomenon or uh, a statement that seems to contradict itself. So what, what is the coastline paradox? So as I was saying under my examples of fractals, that a coastline is an example of a fractal. Um, so how do you see that a coastline is an example of a fractal? Well, if you say maybe think of the coastline of of Norfolk, for example, or Lincolnshire, it's kind of a squiggly line. And if you zoom in, say, to Skegness, the coastline of Skegness, so it's still a wiggly line. And if you go in even closer, when you start to see all the pebbles, it's still a wiggly line. And if you zoom in even closer, you see all the sand particles, which are still kind of, which will still form a wiggly line. So a coastline is an example of a fractal. And what is the coastline paradox? So the coastline paradox, is the phenomenon that when you try and measure the length, um, let me just go back a little because it's maybe a bit distracting to have all those words there. So the coastline paradox is if you try and say, if you picture the coastline of Britain, if you try and measure the length, so the coastline to us, it seems just like a line, right? A wiggly line that goes around the coast of Britain. And um, you might want, so you want, scientists will want to know how long the coastline of Britain is. So you want to measure the coastline. But it, the, par the coastline paradox is that if you try to measure the coastline of Britain more precisely, the longer the coastline just seems to become. So this is a bit counterintuitive, which is why it's called a paradox. Um, and I'll give you a concrete example as to why it's counterintuitive, this phenomenon, um, is because you think the more accurate you should, you try to measure your coastline, 
at some point you should kind of zoom in onto the true value, the length of the coastline. But this didn't seem to happen. It just, the coastline just seemed to blow up to infinity. So let me be a bit more precise about this. The longer the coastline becomes, the more accurate you try and measure the coastline. So if you picture the coastline of Britain, it's kind of like a, a squiggly, a huge squiggly shape. How does one go about trying to measure the length of such a huge irregular shape? Well, one way to approximate the length of um, the coastline of Britain is you could pick um, points along the coast, say as the crow flies of distance 500 kilometers apart all along the coastline, and you can then draw, this, join the dots along the coastline and kind of measure the straight line distances between these chosen points on the coastline and add up all your straight line distances. So that would be one way of approximating the length of your coastline. And you can make your approximation more accurate by choosing more points along your coast, say um, towns along the coast that are maybe 100 kilometers apart, and then add up their straight line distances. For example, so let's have a look at this, uh, what I just said in a more visual uh, context here. So you have this picture here. So the picture on the left, you could, um, could be, say, the case where you pick points along your coast, uh, your coastline that are 500 kilometers apart as the crow flies, and then you just join up the dots and then add up the straight line distances between all these points. So straight line distances we're good at. So this is one way to approximate the coastline and you can see the middle picture it's um it looks like a better approximation doesn't it because you've chosen more points along your coast um your coastline and um when you you would think that um this would be, give you a better approximation and then the last picture you've got uh the best approximation out of all the three you've chosen even more points along your coastline say you pick points that are distance 50 kilometers apart and then you just add up the straight line distances between all those points Okay, so this seems like a natural way to approximate um, the length or the outline of a huge irregular shape, but what's kind of going wrong in some sense here? So let me give you some figures of the, um, the total length you would get for each of these approximations. Right, okay, so we have here a little table, and on the left we have, what, so it says compass settings. So this uh, 500, this value here is the, the distance between the points you've chosen along your coastline. So when you, it says 500, that means you've only chosen points of, as the crow flies 500 kilometers apart on your coastline. So um, this is quite a rough approximation. But anyway, it's an approximation. So if you were to choose points along your coastline that are distance 500 kilometers apart and then add up their straight line distances, you would get that the length of your coastline is 2,600 kilometers long, okay? Right, and then if you increase your approximation, so if you were to then choose points along your coastline that are 100 kilometers apart as the crow flies, and then add up all the straight line distances, your coastline increases significantly to 3,800. And if you keep on doing this, so if you um, choose points about 50 kilometers apart and 17 kilometers apart, you just see that your length of your coastline just seems to blow up and it doesn't seem to indicate that it's going to stabilize at any any given length. So this is a bit odd because if you were to do the same approximation process for say a giant circle, a circle of diameter 100 kilometers, you see that here if you kind of roughly do the same thing, pick points along your circle that are, uh, have a straight line distance as a crow flies of 500 kilometers, you get that the circumference or your outline of your circle is your approximation will give you 3,000. And then if you improve your approxim uh, approximation by choosing points that are about 100 kilometers apart from each other along the outline of your circle, your giant circle, you're pretty much very close to the true value of the circumference. And if you see that if you increase your approximation by another two steps, you basically hit the true value. So the, uh, your approximation converges as you improve, uh, as your approximation gets more precise. So. This is what we expect. What happens for the circle is what you would expect for the coastline, but this is not what happened for the coastline. So what's going wrong here? So it turns out, and this is where house of dimension comes in, that in the 60s, um, so this, let me tell you how house of dimension solved this coastline paradox. So in the 60s, um, I think this was another German mathematician, Mandelbrot showed that um, the house of dimension of your coastline is strictly between one and two. 
So as I mentioned, strictly between one and two, um, and this shows that it's a fractal. And so how does this solve the coastline paradox, this information? So this is telling us the fact that the house of dimension is strictly between one and two. So having house of dimension one is just the same as saying it's a one dimensional object. And having house of dimension two is the same as saying it's a two dimensional object. Um, so when you have house of dimension strictly between one and two, so say 1.3 is probably quite the correct house of dimension for a coastline. Um, so that's saying it's a fractal, which means it's, um, as we saw a coastline, it's, it's an irregular object that when you zoom in, it's still going to be um, just as irregular. And um, so the fact that you've got house of dimension strictly greater than one is saying that you shouldn't treat your coastline like a one dimensional object. And that's what we were doing in the past when we were trying to approximate it as, as if it was just a line. Um, and that's why the length kept blowing up because we we're treating it like a one dimensional object, which we shouldn't. Let me give you, so if this is a bit vague, why we shouldn't treat the coastline like a one dimensional object, let me give you a simple example. So if we take an object that we know doesn't have dimension one to so say a square, uh, which is a two-dimensional object. And if you want to treat it like a one-dimensional object and you want to measure how much space this one-dimensional object, your square, is taking up in, um, in the world, you would measure the length, of course. Every one-dimensional object, you would measure its length. So what would be the length of a square? So um, the length of the square, you would just fill in your square with lines um, and then you would add up the length of all the lines that you need, the line segments that you would need to cover your square. So of course, you're going to need infinitely many lines to fill up your square. And so therefore the length of your square is going to be infinity. So which is telling you nothing about how much area your square is taking up because the right way to measure how much space your two dimensional object takes up in our 3D world is to measure its area and not its length. So that's kind of what's going wrong with um, how we had approximated the coastline. We were treating it like a one dimensional object and trying to measure its length. And that was just not really working. We weren't getting uh, a definite answer. And um, so it was really useful to know that um, this was what was going wrong for the coastline paradox. As you can imagine, if you think back um, hundred years, of, hundreds of years ago, um, people measuring borders and coastlines differently, because if one country, say, had um, a different approximation, a different um, level of preciseness in measuring the coastline from another country, um, they would get different values, of course, and then there would be fights or military issues concerning the countries if they um, one claimed the coastline was longer than um, the other countries. So um, it's always, so knowledge is power. And um, so with this, with Mandelbrot's solution of the coastline paradox, we now know that, okay, um, if you do want to measure the length, approximate the length of your coastline, you should just indicate what the level of your approximation is, because we now understand that if you measure it differently, depending on your level of precision, you're going to get a different answer. Um, so yeah, so this was one claim, um, one of House of Dimensions claim to fame, it solved the coastline paradox. Um, but we've been talking here about fractals and coastlines are an example of fractals and other examples of fractals in nature include snowflakes and uh, broccoli. But the thing is, as you probably guess, uh, in nature, one doesn't really have true fractals. So let's revisit the definition of a fractal. So the definition of a fractal is a shape or a curve that no matter how much you zoom in, uh, it will always look just as irregular. So it repeats itself at any scale on which it is examined. Um, but of course, as you can imagine with snowflakes or coastlines, at some point it will smoothen out because in nature you can't keep on going to infinity. So if we want to, let me give you now some examples of true fractals. So in the sense that you can really keep on zooming into infinity and it will still look exactly the same. But in order to give examples of such fractals, we have to go into mathematics. We can only give such um, examples uh, within mathematics because in nature, it, you can't keep on going to infinity. Okay, so let's look at some examples of mathematical fractals now, and I'll give you exactly precisely the house of dimension of these fractals. Um, so yeah, one more thing about the, the term fractal, let me just say in case um, any of you know Latin, that the term fractal is derived from the Latin word 
fractus, um, which in some sense also says what it is. It's that it's in a regular shape. So fractus means broken and uneven. So I just wanted to put that in. Okay, so let's now have a look at some mathematical fractals. So these are shapes that uh, no matter how much you zoom in, they will still look exactly as the original shape. Um, so although there's lots of examples of such fractals in mathematics, it's also difficult to just kind of give you the picture of these fractals in one go. I have to sort of tell you how you construct them, um, but it's quite straightforward. So let me give you um, the, the first example of a mathematical fractal that I'll like to, sh to show you, and then I'll tell you what the house of dimension is. It's what's called, um, so yeah, examples of mathematical fractals. It's what's called the Cantor set. Okay, and this is also named after German mathematician George Cantor. And okay, so what's going on here? Um, let me actually get rid of the picture and then I'll talk you through what we do and then we'll have a look at the picture. So, so in order to construct this fractal, which is called a Cantor set, you want to imagine, uh, horiz we'll start with a horizontal um, unit segment, so a line of length one. So you can imagine sort of horizontally in front of you. Um, and then we want to take out the middle third of this line. And then of course, we're left with two smaller left seg uh, line segments. And then you want to, for these two remaining line segments, you want to again take out the middle third. And you want to keep on taking out the middle third of what you have left. Okay, now let's have a look at the picture and see what's going on. Okay, so we start at the top with just um, the, a line segment of length one, and then we take out the middle third, that brings us to the second step. Okay, so we've got two lines of length a third, and then in each of these line segments, these complete line segments of length a third, we take out the middle third. So that leaves, leaves us with four line segments, unbroken line segments of length one ninth, and you keep repeating the process. Whenever you see an unbroken line segment, you attack it and you take out the middle third and you keep on doing this process to infinity. And what you have left, once you've done this infinitely many time, uh, times, is what you get just a, a collection of infinitely many points. So the Cantor set is also called the Cantor dust. Um, so yeah, this is an example of a fractal. Um, how do you see that, um, because when you keep repeating this process of taking out the middle third of your unbroken line segment, um, if you keep repeating this to infinity, you just end up with a, a collection of points, infinitely many points. How do you see that um, when you zoom in onto it, no matter which point, it looks like the original picture? So this is where what I have here will help. So if you look at this picture as a whole, Okay, and then if you just look to the left bit, so if you start looking at the line segment that has a length a third and everything below it, you see that that's identical to the original picture, isn't it? It's just scaled down by a third, right? And so if you then if, likewise, if you zoom in onto um, the leftmost picture, starting from the line segment of length and one ninth, if you look at that, it's exactly identical to the original picture. It's just been scaled down by a ninth. So hopefully that's giving you an idea of how uh, you can justify that this is really a fractal. No matter where you zoom in, it looks exactly as the original, like the original picture. Okay, so as I was saying, if you repeat this process of taking out the middle third uh, of every unbroken line segment forever, uh, you will end up with just a collection of points. So for instance, what what sort of points will remain? So if you if you think look back at the top line of length one, if you were to label the leftmost parts of your top line with zero, and if you label the rightmost corner of your top line with one, you see that as you repeat this process of removing the middle third, your endpoints, zero and one, will always remain, right? You will never touch zero and one. So you know that at the end of the day, zero and one will be points in your Cantor set. And um, likewise, if you look at the, on the second level, the line segment of length a third, if you the, label the left endpoint with zero and the right endpoint with a third, you see that the point a third will survive this process. So a third will be in your set. Um, so these are, these are ways to kind of see what sort of numbers will, you will end up with at the end of the day. So at the end of the day, you just get a collection of infinitely many points. And so what do you think the house of dimension of this set of infinitely many points will be? 
So, as I was saying, that um, a one dimension, uh, an object of house of dimension one is just the same as our usual concept of a one dimensional object, the line. And a two dimensional object is like a square, and a zero dimensional object, as we know it, is like a point, a dot. Um, so, I'm saying this Cantor set has got um, is a collection of infinitely many dots of points. Um, so, you would think it shouldn't it be have house of dimension zero because a, a dot just has house of dimension zero. Uh, but actually, this Cantor set is a collection of so many points, infinitely many points, that it's so dense that it has house of dimensions strictly greater than zero. So it is really, it does take up more space than just um, a few collection of points because you've got so many points. So, okay. So what is a house of dimension of the set? So it turns out, if you're familiar with log, that is precisely, uh, so I've just denoted the house of dimension of the Cantor set by little s, um, it's log two over log three. So if you're familiar with log, um, you, sh you hopefully you can see that this number, log two divided by log three, is strictly between zero and one. So the fact that it's strictly greater than zero is saying that this takes up more space than just a handful of dots. You've just got so many dots that it's, it behaves differently. And the fact that the house of dimension is, is strictly less than one, so log two over log three is strictly less than one. It's about 0 0.67, I think, um, or maybe not, but around zero than 0 0.67. So the fact that it's got a house of dimension strictly less than one is saying that it's got no length. So it does not take up as much space as a line. Um, so the house of dimension is telling us stuff about um, properties of the set. Okay, so this is one example of a mathematical fractal and its house of dimension, the Cantor set. Let me give you another example. This one is called the Koch snowflake. So it's a mathematical snowflake. Um, okay, so again, it's a bit difficult to just give you one picture of the snowflake, I have to kind of slowly tell you how you construct it. And it's similar to the construction that we saw for the Cantor set. So if you imagine starting with, again, your horizontal line of length one, and you remove the middle third, this time you want to add a little hat to where your middle third was. Okay, so um, this is kind of the first three steps in how you construct the snowflake. So you start by looking at the top line and how do you get to the second line so the second line you first have removed the middle third of your top line and then you've added a hat but the thing about your hat is that um, the side length of your hat is will be a th uh, have length a third so um, the horizontal left part has length a third and your left slanting side of your hat um, has length a third and the right slanting side has got also length a third and then the right horizontal bit has got length a third so you're made up of four line segments that have this equal length okay so that's the middle picture and then the third picture what have we done so we've attacked every straight line segment and have repeated the same process from the first step to the second step so you can see um the left, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse, but um, my, the arrow, but the left on the third picture, the, the bottom left part, I've removed the middle third and added a hat. And then the left slanting part, I've removed the middle third and added a hat. And then the right slanting part here, um, I've removed the middle third and added a hat and so on. So you, so the process here, which you keep on repeating to infinity, is you attack every straight line segment, remove the middle third and you add a hat okay um so you kind of keep doing this to infinity at, at some point it gets a bit difficult to draw but you can kind of see it's looking like a side of a snowflake right um and actually it's called the cost snowflake and but you may look at this and think okay it doesn't look very much like a snowflake but um if you were so if you go back to the first picture when i had just a horizontal line if you start with three straight lines in the form of a triangle and then repeat the same process then then hopefully now it looks more like a snowflake to you okay so here one can um go about calculating the house of dimension yes yeah, so sorry i don't have actually time to tell you how you calculate the house of dimension it's not difficult but i would just need um some time to let you know uh, but here let me tell you that the house of dimension of a Koch snowflake is um, log four over log three. So again, if you're familiar with log, this is strictly greater than one. It's about 
Okay, I'm not sure exactly what this is. 1.5, say, or well, actually maybe 1.4 or 1.3 is probably a better answer. Um, what is this telling us about our Koch snowflake? So the fact that it has got house soft dimension strictly greater than one, it's kind of behaving like um, a coastline in the sense that it's an object, a shape that takes up more space than a, a one dimensional object. So if you were to do the same thing and try and measure the length of a Koch snowflake, it would just blow up to infinity because it doesn't behave like a one dimensional object. So uh, its length would then be infinity. So it's useful to know the house of dimensions because then you can understand properties of the object and then treat it accordingly. Okay, so hopefully this has given you a rough idea of how house of dimension was used um, when it was introduced in the 30s, 40s, and so on. But as um, I said at the beginning, actually my research has to do with house of dimensions in algebraic structures, like which are called groups. Um, and so what have we done here with the house of dimension of the Koch snowflake and the Cantor set? We have calculated the house of dimension of these objects in our three-dimensional world. So what I do in groups, um, I, the, my, our three-dimensional world gets replaced with a fixed algebraic structure, a group, and I'm interested in computing the house of dimension of their substructures. So kind of like what we've done here with fractals in our 3D world, but I'm looking at, instead of our world, um, a fixed algebraic structure, a group, and I'm interested in studying the house of dimensions of their substructures. Um, so just to give you a quick idea, this is kind of a, a result from one of my papers. So maths at university level does get quite wordy, so there's lots of words involved. But essentially, I was studying um, the house of dimensions of all the substructures in one in one group, and so which we call the house of spectrum, the collection of all house of dimensions. And we showed that you get intervals and also some uh, isolated points. So this is uh, just a, a sneak preview into uh, my work, which um, will look really alien because group theory is really a language that one has to learn. And um, I haven't explained all the terms to you here at all. But yeah, just to kind of give you an idea of what a maths paper would, would look like. And that's really all I have to say. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anita, for your wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you. It uh, shines uh, the light on one of the most enigmatic mathematical objects. Uh, and uh, and uh, I will we'll just uh, look on the questions. Uh, just remind people that um, uh, uh, questions can be placed uh, in a, a live chat of YouTube or in a Padlet. And, I already see that uh, there are questions and there are comments in the live chat. Uh, there is a, a comment from Helen Krista Dolidi, who actually gave her first uh, opening uh, talk in this week, and she tells the fractals are very related with Kao's theory. Ah. And she said, Thank you. Oh, very so, cool. Thank you. So there is basically a connection between different parts of math. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we have a, a question from uh, uh, Castaldi. Uh, thank you. What did you use to draw the last graphic? Um, I didn't actually draw it myself. I got the picture from the internet, so I'm not very good at drawing, I'm afraid. So yeah, I can't give any um, helpful tips there. I'm really bad at drawing on the computer. You're probably better than me. So now we uh, look on uh, uh, questions uh, I see in the Padlet, uh, and there are various questions. Uh, um, do fractals make uh, complicated explanations or simple? Yeah, I guess it did, perhaps. Um, so with the coastline paradox, for example, that um, solved the complicated phenomenon that the coastline, the length was blowing up. So that kind of uh, solved the problem and then made it understandable and simple. Um, so it, I guess it depends on the context. So I would generally say yes, it would, um, because it would shed some light on the situation and therefore one understands it better. And when you understand things then it becomes simpler. Um, so yes, I guess the answer would be yes. 
Thank you. And that, and then I see the question which uh, somebody asked every every uh, speaker. What made you to choose your research field? It kind of chose, that's a very good question. I would say it chose me uh, when I was a master's student and we had to take all kinds of different pure maths courses um, as part of the degree. This was the one that I found just came more naturally to me. It seemed to make more sense and um, it was the easier one as opposed to the others. Like I find um, some like geometry, differential geometry uh, quite difficult. Um, so this was the one that was just more fun because it was easier and it just seemed to make more sense. So I would guess I'd say it, it chose me. Uh, uh, then uh, there is a, a, a question uh, from Andy Ellison in a live chat. It's uh, it's kind of between very different disciplines. Would it be correct to say that fractal theory breaks down an atomic scales in the real world? I think that's, yes, uh, that's a good question. And I suppose, yes, the answer is probably yes in the real world. Um, because um, as I was saying, um, in nature, examples of fractals are not true fractals. They are approximate fractals. You can zoom in maybe four times and then in the snowflake, for example, then you stop seeing any spiky nature because it has to stop at some point. Um, so I guess fractal theory in mathematics um, is built on um, mathematical fractals that will, when you zoom into infinity, it will still look exactly as it originally did. So yes, in the real world, it's always an approximation of um, all these theories in mathematics, yeah. And then there is a just question just arriving. Uh, what is your favorite part of math? Um, no, that's a good question. Um, I do like how soft I mention in groups. I do like that one. Um, but the other kind of um, uh, favorite aspect that I like is within group theory as well, is um, on what's called branch groups. These are groups that act on, on trees, on mathematical trees. Um, and I do like those a lot. Um, so yeah, those are my two favorite parts. So, yeah. And then uh, there is a you know, quite mathematical question. Are there groups of fractals? Um, so some of these branch groups, that's a very nice question. Some of these branch groups are fractal groups. Um, so that if you zoom in on the subgroups, they look exactly like the original group. So no matter how much you zoom in, it still looks like the original group. Um, so I guess maybe the question can be interpreted in two ways. You can look at a given fractal and talk about the symmetries of your fractal, and you could call that a fractal group. And yes, we, we do have those. So yeah. There are fractal groups, I guess, the short, the short answer, yeah. And then I see there is um, uh, one more question arrives in the live chat from uh, Castaldi as well. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give an example of a simple group and give its house door dimension? Um, yes, um, so, uh, well, this is a bit of a cheap answer. So, um, there are infinite groups and finite groups. So as I was saying, a group is a collection of symmetries. And um, so the symmetry say of a cube, you've only got finitely many symmetries, you can rotate. Okay, let's take a square. A square is a lot easier than a cube. So if you can rotate your square 90 degrees um, and after four times you're back to the beginning. So that's a finite symmetry. You do four times and then you're back to the beginning. But there are instances where you have um, infinite number of symmetries and that would be called an infinite group and so um how soft dimensions of a in a group remember um so i was saying that um house of dimension of a fractal you 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 talk about you start you compute the house of dimension of a fractal in relation to how it sits lives in our 3d world for groups you have to fix a group and then you're asking the question what are the house of dimension of the sub groups in your fixed group and um if you have an infinite group and you pick any, uh, so the house of dimension of the whole group in, it, in itself will be one. So that's a bit of a, a, a trivial case. And if you pick any finite subgroup in your infinite group, its house of dimension will be zero. So I guess loosely speaking, house of dimension gives you a measure of the relative density in your group. So if you have a finite subgroup, oh, excuse me, in your infinite group, then the house of dimension of the finite one is going to be 
really small because the finite group is so small in relation to the big one. Um, so yeah, the finite group will have house of dimension zero. Thank you, thank you very much. And then there are questions uh, uh, like generic. Can students study fractals in Lincoln? Yes, um, our second years are doing a project on fractals and the coastline paradox and um, also based on households I mentioned in groups. Also, the first years um, can study fractals. It's not a formal module. Some universities do, um, so I learn households I mentioned as a second year, um, but not all universities offer that as a fixed module, but um, we offer it as an optional, as one of the optional topics for a project. So, yeah. We do do it in Lincoln, yeah. Right, okay. And uh, then uh, I, I, in Padlet, I'm just checking if there is anything like, in Padlet, again, there is a, a kind of interdisciplinary question. How do okay. fractals help biological and chemistry research, for example, into atom bonds? Um, I'm not so sure. There's a colleague of um, ours in Lincoln, uh, Danilo. He knows more about these than I do. Um, but, um, for example, arteries, they are examples of fractals. And uh, so one could measure the house of dimension of that, and that could give you uh, an indication of how um, the density of the arteries in that particular area. So with that knowledge, one could then have... Um, yeah, use it for applications. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, I'm not an expert, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so it's a huge field. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the, and, and as, as all this in such field, people from different sub-disciplines uh, work and then we slowly understand it better. There is um, also a very generic question I see here. Who is your inspiration in math? Um. I have, uh, I'm, oh, that's a, a good question. Um, I didn't really have like um, uh, one math position who inspired me, which often people do. Um, but I suppose um, I was really lucky. I had lots of really nice lecturers that um, uh, were really helpful and, enc and encouraging. And so that definitely, and really good colleagues that again were very encouraging and that always helps. But um, I suppose maybe, um, the inspiration that I had to do my PhD was my dad, because he did his PhD when we were little, and um, uh, it was really difficult for him having five kids running around. And um, but he did complete his PhD despite all the odds, uh, the difficulties. So I would say my dad, um, even though he didn't do mathematics, um, my dad was my inspiration. Thank you very much, Anita. Um, there is another question, which, mathematical perhaps. Uh, can be an object with dimension between two and three? Very good question. I didn't give an example of that, but yes, um, we one can construct mathematical, um, so not in our real, um, yeah, I'm sure we there is an object as well in nature that has that house of dimension, but in mathematics, you can construct lots of examples um, which have house of dimensions even greater, four, four point anything, five, as large as you want. So, yeah. Right. So it's a, indeed very, very fascinating. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, oh, it actually, right, question uh, from uh, Helen Christa de Lidli. What about the broccoli? <laughs> I did. Um, I would guess that that's probably, as house of dimension, um, greater than two. I would guess. I haven't calculated it myself, unfortunately, but I would guess that it's more than two. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think we, we just arrived good in time um, at, at 55, uh, uh, and perhaps the broccoli is a, is a good kind of uh, uh, point to stop reminding us about uh, uh, perhaps preparing broccoli for dinner. Uh, <laughs> and with that, I would like actually to thank uh, you Anita, for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, 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 to thank everyone who came uh, to listen to ask questions. As usual, arrive more questions uh, than uh, we were able to to put in, within this time. Uh, but we uh, we have to run in a, in a, in a, in a, show, in, in a uh, uh, confined time scale as we have one more lecture just coming in a few minutes from now. So thank you very much, Anita. Thank you very much, everyone who came. Uh, we hope uh, perhaps to see you uh, in the next lecture 
or to see in one of our uh, following uh, public lectures, which uh, we surely will organize more. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.